Hoga Trafficom Langinian. The 3rd of September 1967, Hoga Trafficom Langinian. That was the day in Sweden that they switched from driving on the left hand side of the road to the right hand side of the road. So Hoga Traffic on Langenjen is Swedish for right hand traffic reorganization. So that was the day on the 3rd of September and you can see the picture there. Um, not an easy day to be out on the road, probably want to avoid that day. Um, but it's true isn't it, going the wrong way brings chaos actually and you can see that in the picture there. And I think that's true for life as well, isn't it? And Today we're going to look at the book of Judges in the Old Testament. So if you have a Bible, uh, you could turn to the Old Testament. It's near the beginning after Joshua, the book of Joshua. Uh, this is the period, the, the, the Judges is the period between the death of Joshua and the anointing of Saul as king. So it's about 400 years as far as time goes. And really, Judges is this kind of repetition of a chaotic pattern, really. Uh, a chaotic pattern of God's people wandering away from him, turning their back on him, no longer loving him with all their heart, soul, mind, turning to idol worship. In fact, uh, the very last verse of Judges is interesting. The very last verse of, verse of Judges kind of sums up, really, um, often the case of the, uh, the people, God's people. In those days, Israel had no king, so everyone did as he saw fit. And that kind of sums up what kept happening, turning their back on God. This would then bring judgment. The people would then cry out to God. God would hear their cry. He would raise up a judge, uh, a man or a woman, um, who would be empowered by the Spirit of God to bring deliverance to God's people. The people would then repent, and that means kind of have a change of mind, turn away from their sin and turn back to God, and that would result in peace. And isn't that interesting? That is just such a picture of the gospel, isn't it, really? How we have turned our back on God, we kind of live for ourselves, we do what is right in our own eyes, and that has consequences, means we are separated from God now and forever, and we face judgment, but God gives a deliverer in the person of Jesus Christ and sends Jesus, the one who comes, who uh, died in our place, the grave could not hold him, rose from the dead, defeating sin and death, and the call is to turn to him, to put your trust in him, turn away from our sin, and he is the one who forgives us and restores us and brings peace to our lives. So I trust that you have made that decision, but if you haven't, if you're here this morning or even watching online and you're sitting there thinking, actually, I don't have peace in my heart with God, then maybe today is the day to come to him knowing that he gives peace, true peace. And he is just waiting for us to call out to him, and he is faithful, and we'll do that. So Judges, oh, we're going to go to Judges chapter 6 this morning, here on this Father's Day. Uh, this is the account of Gideon. Judges chapter 6, it's worth pointing out the very last words of chapter 5, actually. The very last words say this, Then the land had peace forty years. So they had just been through this cycle of turning away from God, crying out to God, God giving a deliverer, peace had come. And then we read in chapter 6, verse 1, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So this chaotic cycle is about to restart again. The people turn their back on God. We know that they're worshipping idols. We read about that in later verses in chapter 6. We read about the altar set up to Baal, who is a foreign god. We read of the Asherah pole. This is a, a sacred tree or pole that was set up for the pagan goddess Asherah. 
And there is this sense of God's people just kind of merging in with a culture, we would say acquiescing to the culture, which means kind of just having to fit in, maybe reluctantly, but just becoming like the culture. And so judgment comes. In that verse 1, for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. God handed them over. And this really is a desperate situation for the people of God. Let's read verses 1 to 5. And, and just as we read it, just try and picture what it is like for God's people. Again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. So catch that. It says here, the power of Midian was so oppressive. There's like this sense of a, a wave of anti-God sentiment destroying their way of life. God had given the people this land. So many good things, all that they needed, crops, livestock, it was a fruitful land. And as the enemy swept in, isn't it interesting, the enemy didn't just simply take things, but the Bible says the enemy ruined the crops and did not spare a living thing. A fruitful land trashed by the enemy. And God's people are simply overwhelmed. That verse 5, again, the second part, it was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. So here's the question. What was the response of God's people? Well, their initial response we read in verse 2. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. So here we are. The people of God are hiding away. A sense of resignation, a sense of hopelessness. Where is God? A sense of defeat, no way out. In the face of a culture imploding around them, in the face of, of oppression and injustice, in the face of this like tsunami of anti-God sentiment seeking to ruin and destroy their lives. And so the people there have a choice, don't they? You know, think about our own culture. You know, in many respects, our culture today is becoming more and more oppressive for those who follow Christ. And at the heart of it is the attack on which God described as very good. Our identity as made in the image of God. You know, think of our culture where young people measure their worth not by who they are in Christ, but by the number of likes they get on social media. And then we're shocked when self-harming amongst 9 to 12-year-olds has doubled in six years. Or where young people today are taught to forget that God created male and female, but that gender fluidity is normal, or to be encouraged, or to be even expected. And then we wonder why there's so much confusion regarding sexuality, even what it means to be biologically male and female. Where well, last month, the University of London published results of a survey where 80% of 16 to 17-year-olds regularly access online pornography. And then we wonder why, just two weeks ago, the chief inspector of schools would then be shocked at the scale of sexual abuse among children in UK schools, where sexual harassment has become normalized. A culture in which the richest woman in this country made her fortune as the owner of a betting chain, an industry worth over 14 billion pounds a year, and then we're dismayed when last year five million people experienced harm directly linked to gambling 
including marriages breaking up and families ruined. Or where modern day slavery, whether that's sex trafficking or slave labor, is hiding in plain sight around us, even in the shadow of toppling statues, or where the most dangerous place to live in the UK is the mother's womb, and where the end of life may also soon become just as dangerous as the push to legalize euthanasia intensifies. So many good things that God has given, a fruitful land being trashed by the enemy around us. And make no mistake, this is a spiritual battle that we're in. And yes, God's people have a choice. Some hide away, resigned, perhaps with a sense of hopelessness. Where is God in all of this? Even acquiescing to the prevailing culture. Some even moving away from the word of God. In essence, making God in their own image, creating their own idols, setting up their own Asherah pole to the the godless culture around us, and in so doing, become a party to the trashing of all which is good, even that which God describes as very good. If you head in the wrong direction, it leads to chaos. So what is the best choice? Chapter 6, verse 6. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. I was so challenged when I was reading that and preparing, thinking, you know, what would it take for us to cry out to God? At what point do we kind of get to that breaking point where we say, okay, we just need to cry out to God, nothing else. The people of God got to that point here. They cried out to the Lord. They were so impoverished. Verse 7. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The first thing is, just note how quickly God replies, how swiftly God comes to show mercy and to forgive, how quickly he hears prayer that sinners may be encouraged and turn to him. And so, again, if you're watching this and you know that you don't have peace in your heart with God, that you're separated from him, he really is only a prayer away. When you cry out to him, he is faithful and will come and forgive you your sin and bring that peace. Here, God sends a prophet to convince the people of their sin. That's the first thing. Then he reminds them of his faithfulness to them, that he is their God, that he has not changed and yet they have turned to worship others. And that's the charge facing the people here. You have not listened to me. You have not obeyed. They have turned their backs on him. They're so caught up in the prevailing culture, caught up in idolatry, where God no longer is the first in their hearts. They're missing God's best. And now things are a mess in front of them. The land is ravaged and lives are being destroyed. So verse 11, the angel of the Lord came. That's great, isn't it? The angel of the Lord came. Here, the very presence of God, and most scholars would agree, almost certainly the pre-incarnate Son of God. And we'll see that kind of demonstrated as we go on. The Son of God, the one who was and who is and who is to come. The Son of God who appears several times in the Old Testament, whether that's with Abraham as he stands looking over Sodom and Gomorrah, or with Jacob kind of wrestling with him just before he's about to meet his brother Esau, or Joshua when he's about to go into Jericho, such a critical moment facing this formidable city, and there the Son of God stands as the commander of the army of the Lord. The Son of God, who would later stand in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as the fourth person protecting his people. I don't don't know what your picture of Jesus is, but don't limit your picture as, as the baby in the manger or 
a picture of a, of a man in a stained glass window. The Old Testament shows that he is mighty in battle. He is a defender of his people. He is Jehovah Shammah, as it says in the Hebrew. God is there. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abrazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. So here we find Gideon. He's on his own and he's threshing wheat. But he should have been threshing wheat, you would expect, on a threshing floor with oxen. But actually, he's in the winepress. You would not expect him to be threshing wheat in the winepress. But the Bible tells us why he's hiding what little wheat he has from the Midianites. And here's a picture of someone who is oppressed in a hopeless situation. And then we have this amazing verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Isn't that an amazing statement? What an encouraging statement. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And the Lord here in Hebrew, that is Yahweh, Jehovah. This is the name that we first, uh, it's revealed when Moses is before the, the bush that isn't burning. And, and Moses said, when I go to my people, who, who, who should I say is sending me? And that's when God reveals his personal name, Yahweh, the name he would be known by for generations and generations to come. And that's the word here, the Lord, Yahweh. God saying, I am with you. The very presence of God with Gideon, giving him his commission here, mighty warrior. Even though Gideon is hiding away, even though, as we read soon, that his family is the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh, and he's the least in his family, now the presence of God is enough to make him mighty warrior. It's like God is provoking that potential within Gideon, awakening it. I couldn't help but be reminded of 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9 at this point, where it, the Bible says, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth that he might strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Isn't that, the Bible is like, it's all the way through. God is looking. God is looking for men and women, young people, whose heart is completely given to him, that he might strengthen you, that he might involve you in his purposes. Where is the mighty warrior today? Where is the one whose heart is fully committed to him? the one who desires to live a holy life set apart unto the Lord, to stand in his name no matter what the cost. I don't know, even as you're listening to this, as you hear God's word, do you sense that stirring within? Do you hear his call to you even this day? To live that knowing that all things are possible through him. To live with that warrior spirit and this is Gideon's moment. And isn't it surprising? He has quite a tentative response to verse 13. He's just been told, mighty warrior. And verse 13, uh, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hands of Midian. So Gideon has two questions here. Why has all this happened and where is God? And maybe you have similar questions today when you think about your own life. Yes, but where is God when... How can God be in control when... Here, Gideon is hidden away, seemingly helpless, hopeless, and it would seem that he is a skeptic regarding any help coming from God. But... But his very questions point to something different. His very questions signal that despite the oppressive culture, there is something smoldering within Gideon. There's that little flicker within him. He knows God's track record. He knows that God is able. He knows that God is not dead. He can't see how this is going to work out, but... A few years ago, I was reading about Lord Shaftesbury in London. 
In the 1800s he lived, he was uh, from a noble family, wealthy family, had much to inherit. And uh, as a young man, he was walking in London. And as he was walking along, he found himself following a coffin that was being carried by four pallbearers. But he could tell it was a coffin of, of a poor person. The coffin was really badly made, and the pallbearers were drunk. So they were stumbling down the street with this coffin. And very soon, they stumbled, and the coffin fell to the ground, split open, and the body of this poor man rolled in the street. And when you read about Lord Shaftesbury and read about that moment in his life, as he saw that incident, as he saw the body of this poor man losing his dignity in every way, it's described like hidden fires were stirred within Shaftesbury. Hidden fires were stirring within him. Something was smoldering. And a journey started from that point where he was to give his life as a, a burden grown, uh, grew within him. Give his life for the poor. Particularly the poor working in their, in their working conditions. Children who were working in factories. And he started to, 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 to help and to try and change things. And it was so difficult for him because he was very much on his own. Not many standing with him. And it got to a point where he kind of took a step back and almost couldn't carry on. But then, as one biographer described it, when the smoldering spiritual flame caught fire at last, he woke to the realization of his position. And something changed within Shaftesbury. And he sacrificed his career. He could quite easily have been prime minister, it was felt at the time, because he was jeered in Parliament. Nobody wanted to support him as he stood up for the poor and he stood up for children working long hours in factories. And there was this key point, a key point where it was like, I've got to make a decision here. And at that point, his wife said to him, and here's a quote, and what a great quote it is. His wife said to Shrasbury, it's your duty and the consequences we must leave. Go forward and to victory. Isn't that an amazing statement from your spouse? You can imagine Shaftesbury hearing that. And history was changed as he stepped out. Here I am, Lord. Send me. It's God revealing a need within you. Maybe there's a need that you have seen and it just kind of stirs within you. Is God calling you to something particular? Back to the scripture, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Isn't that a beautiful phrase? The Lord turned to him. Yahweh, Jehovah, turned to Gideon. Look to him. Can you imagine that in that moment? I was immediately reminded when I was preparing about Peter stepping out of the boat and walking on water. You remember the account where Jesus was out on the water and he said, come to me. And Peter, while he kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on the water. As soon as he took his eyes off Jesus, he started to sink. When he started to look at his circumstances, down into the water, he went. And isn't it interesting here that as the Lord looks at Gideon, Notice, he did not answer Gideon's questions. But in that moment, Gideon's faith was revived. His fears were silenced. Go in the strength that you have, the strength from the Lord. And the Bible talks about this so much. Be strong, be courageous. I am with you. Be bold. And so God says, go in the strength that you have. Save Israel. That's something, isn't it? Save Israel. They are so oppressed by the Midianites, they're all in hiding. And God is saying to him, go, save Israel, bring the hope, bring deliverance. I am raising you up, mighty warrior. Gideon, an ordinary man, really had nothing to offer. But God said, I'm raising you up. And then this key phrase, am I not sending you the one who has all power and authority in heaven and on earth. Am I not sending you? That is all you need to know. 
that he is sending. And he is still sending today. I was thinking about some of the people who have been sent out from this church, and I probably missed several, but I was thinking of some of the people that have been sent out in recent years. I was thinking of someone like Marie. Some of you will remember Marie Adamkova, who was here for a couple of years and did some training with us. And then um, she married a guy called Joshua in the United States. They settled in the States. But then they just decided to get this increasing burden to take the gospel to the Czech Republic, where 91% of people say there is no God. And that burden just grew within them. And last year, they made that transition. They left the comfort of the American dream and went across to the Czech Republic. Or someone like Mark Randall. Some of you will remember Mark, who visited Zambia a few times. And God just got hold of his heart for Zambia, for the people who do not know Jesus, but also for the church, and particularly the leaders, many of whom don't even have a Bible. And God is using Mark in an amazing way fulfilling his purposes of equipping literally thousands of leaders, not just with the Bible, but with the tools to effectively equip their people to reach a lost nation for Christ. Or someone like Armand here some years ago now, who heard the call to go to Peru, and is out in Peru seeking as part of what he does to to reach unreached people groups there in Peru, leaving the comfort of this country because he heard the call of God. Am I not sending you? That is a sufficient guarantee. That is the only guarantee you need because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the Bible tells us. Verse 15. Here's Gideon again. Another tentative reply. The Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. What a wonderful verse that is. Gideon, utterly weak, utterly unfit for purpose, unworthy, just the person that God delights to use. And I was thinking of some of the biblical examples, because the Bible is full of people, aren't they? Isn't it? Full of people who really, in the world's eyes, yeah, this is not for you. I made a list of some of them. Moses, who couldn't speak very well. David, who was an obscure shepherd boy. Rahab, a prostitute. Elijah, who was burned out. Naomi, a widow. Jeremiah, who was too young. Abraham, who was too old. Thomas, who doubted. Timothy, who was sickly and timid. Jonah, who ran away. Martha, who was worried. Lazarus, who was dead. And Samson, well, he just had long hair, but it was his weakness. Think about when God announced the birth of Jesus. Who did he announce the birth of Jesus to? Lowly shepherds. Nobody wanted to be a shepherd, but that's who he went to. And he announced his resurrection to marginalized women. And he called Peter, an uneducated fisherman with a short fuse, to lead the church. All of them, just like us, the Bible says, are like jars of clay, fragile. And the reason for that, the Bible says, is so that his power, his all-surpassing power, can be seen in us. And people will know this has to be of God, not of me. And there is no danger here whatsoever of any credit going to Gideon. And the Lord continues to be gracious with Gideon because the objections... Hesitations continue as you read on. But verse 16, just after Gideon said, look, I'm too weak. What does the Lord answer in verse 16? I will be with you. I will be with you. That is all that Gideon needs to know. And it's the same today for us. Jesus says, I will be with you, even to the end of the age. The call of God is a remarkable thing. And it's always different. For Moses, it was a bush that appeared to be burning, but wasn't burning. For Simon, it was a a miraculous catch of fish. And then Jesus says to him, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. For Lord Shaftesbury, it was that hidden fire stirring within. For Joshua and Marie, going to the Czech Republic, it was a growing burden. We need to go. And the promise for each of them was the same. Am I not sending you? I will be with you. So Moses stands before the most powerful man in Egypt and says, let my people go. Simon, 
who denied Jesus. Jesus gave him the name Cephas, Peter, which means the rock, his new name, leading the church. Shaftesbury, Lord Shaftesbury, who just went for it. And laws were changed in our country because of Lord Shaftesbury. It is different today because of that man. And you know, at the time when he died, they carried his coffin through the streets of London. At that point, more people came out to watch his coffin than any other person before him that's recorded. And it was all the ordinary common people coming out. He made such an impact in their lives. And Joshua and Marie, well, their story is still unfolding. Gideon, mighty warrior. God called Gideon to himself. First thing he was called to do was to remove the idols. We, you can read about that later. And then to step into his calling to save Israel from the Midianites. And what a crucial moment that is. You can hear the call of God and you can feel that stirring, but will you take that first step? It's a critical moment stepping out and Gideon did so. Just one more verse to highlight, just going ahead to verse 34, because it's such a, a beautiful verse and such an important truth. When Gideon stepped out, verse 34, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Literally, in the Hebrew, which is the original language of the Old Testament, it means the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? The Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. This is God's work. And God brought about a remarkable victory. You can read about the story of Gideon, how he defeated the Midianites, not with a huge and vast army, but with just 300 men. And so the question this morning, whether you're here or watching online, do you hear his call? Do you sense those hidden fires just stirring within you? Are you ready to surrender yourself afresh so that the Spirit of the Lord can clothe himself with you? Even as you hear God's word, do you sense God provoking that potential within you? To stand as a mighty warrior. And remember, before Gideon was Deborah, by the way, this may be Father's Day and we're talking about Gideon, but before Gideon was Deborah, so maybe that's a warrioress, I don't know. But in an oppressive culture, are you ready to take your stand? to bring the hope of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, wherever he sends you, knowing that he is the one who sends to go until either he calls you home or until our ultimate hope, he returns in all his glory. Let's take a moment to pray together as we consider our response to his word. And as you have your eyes closed, as we have this kind of attitude of prayer, let me read that verse 14 again. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And as we pray, I want to pray for you this morning, wherever you are, that if you sense that stirring within, you don't even know necessarily what it's to or what it's for, but you just sense God stirring you as you see our culture around us and the many needs that there are. I want to pray for you this morning that the Lord would ignite those, that smoldering within, that it would burst into flame and that you would discover God's calling for your life. It starts with that first step, stepping out. I want to pray for you. And also pray for you this morning, whether you're here or watching online, if you know that you do not have peace in your heart with God. Today is the day. Today is the day of his salvation. As you cry out to him, he will hear your voice, forgive your sin, and bring you into his family, giving you peace in your heart. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for those that have gone before us, people like Gideon, and what we can learn from their lives. And thank you, Lord, that you involve us in your purposes. We see it right from the beginning, right to the present day. 
Lord, how you call your people, men, women, young people, call them to be part of your, ser- uh, your, um, your purposes for this world at this time. And Lord, thank you that you have a calling for each one of us. And Lord, I pray for those here today, listening online, who sense that kind of hidden fire stirring within. Oh Lord, would you ignite this into flame. Lord, would you grant the, the courage and boldness to take that step of faith. To take a step of faith in Jesus' name, knowing that you are the one who is sending. Knowing that your promise is that I will never leave you or forsake you. Lord, strengthen my brother or sister this day as they take that step. And Lord, for those who know that they do not have peace in their hearts with you this day, oh Lord Jesus, thank you for the good news that when we call out to you, you are faithful in answering, Lord, that your desire is to forgive sin as we repent and turn to you, that you wipe sin away and bring new life and a peace in our heart with you. And Lord, I pray for any person who is in that position even this day. Lord, we pray, oh Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Lord, forgive me for going my own way and doing my own thing, living as I see fit in my own eyes. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on a cross to take my sin upon yourself. And thank you that the grave could not hold you and you were raised from the dead defeating death, breaking the curse of sin. And so, Lord Jesus, I turn to you this day. I choose to put my trust in you and to receive your forgiveness. I choose to follow you. Help me to do that. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 And let me encourage you, if you have prayed either of those prayers. If you're here today or online and you sense that stirring within, then come and talk to me afterwards or you can contact me online. You can send an email to the the church office here. Um, If you want to know more about uh, who Jesus is or you've prayed that prayer to ask him to bring peace into your heart, the next step would be, a a good step would be going to our website, called junction316.co.uk. It talks more about the gospel there and also gives you a contact point. That's www.junction316.co.uk. We're going to close as we sing a song, These Are the Days of Elijah. And we've picked this particularly because it mentions a few people whom God, just ordinary people who God got a hold of and did amazing things through their lives. And the chorus reminds us of the ultimate hope that we look to, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the days ahead. So let's stand together as we conclude with this song.